and uh, never mind. I'll I'll basically take you through the various ideas that that went into yeah pop up the image that went into this icon as you probably have already noticed from the icons that i've been doing in recent years i've been trying to incorporate um different colored halos is normally people think of icons as by default requiring a gold halo and a gold background and Gradually, what I've been basically doing is um, taking an alternative route and working with the symbolic capacity and the aesthetic potential of, of color as a background in context for the represented saint or sacred event, and also various colored halos so red green blue in this case um so in order to open up um uh, a language that is i think more 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 in tune with how iconography actually historically has played out colored halos were used um, in the Byzantine period. You see them often in enamel uh, enamel work. So work from the 1100s, for example, you find blue halos, green halos, red halos in various shades, dark, lighter colors. And so <clears throat> when it came time to do this icon, uh, it dawned on me, all right, I, if I'm going to be dealing with the topic or the theme of St. Dionysius, I'm going to have to somehow bring into it a color dimension that speaks about his theology and um, in a way that, that is unique. And it will make this, this icon, I thought, uh, it's, it'll, it'll facilitate standing out from other icons. And that's another thing that I try to uh, deal with with iconography uh, somehow bring unique components without compromising its efficacy within a traditional context to have it sort of like speak its own voice um, for it to be heard but without it being too loud or too assertive where people think that it's too aggressive in its in its visual language and so <clears throat> the other components that i thought of um i think you might have read the the article on the blue halo most of you might have read that article so you already know i don't need to go into that you already know how it plugs into the notion of the divine darkness and also the tradition of considering the uh, illumined uh, noose as uh, blue in in color, which is a unique is a unique way of speaking about things because you have in the philokalic tradition a very apophatic emphasis on formlessness, right, and being detached from sense impressions and the warning against forming any kind of like imagery in your mind concerning the deity and uh, especially thinking of the deity as consisting of specific colors and you see this in the Diodokos Fotiki for example he, he warns nevertheless at the same time there are also passages where it talks based on scripture on the vision of Moses in Sinai of uh, the presence, the divine presence, the divine darkness, or the, the manifestation of God as consisting of a, the experience of an azure kind of like color, a blue kind of color. So there is a tension there, uh, which go, we'll discuss later as we, the conversation builds up on the interesting uh, tensions between apathetic and apathetic. But um, so I thought, well, that would be an excellent, you know, he is 
you know, considered by Saint Dion by Saint Maximus the Confessor uh, and and Saint Gregory Palamas as a uh, an unerring beholder of noetic truths or something like that they they call him and so i thought well let me let me take on that like elaborate on that and and use the the blue not only as signifying of course in many contexts not only in the in, in the traditional um uh, Eastern context, but also Western context, and you could even say in in, in other religious traditions, blue as uh, a symbol of the eternal, the infinite, the transcendent, but also it relating to the Lumen News, which basically brings nicely together the notion of the kingdom of God is within you, and <clears throat> also illumination consisting of uh, a synergic participation in the uncreated energies of God. And so, so all this was in my mind. Um, that was the traditional context. In terms of form, the way that I approached this icon, I tried to create a contrast between the uh, volumetric form and shallow frontal flat articulation of form. So for example, the face, the, the, the St. Dionysius' uh, countenance has a very, very much a concrete-like definition and also the gospel and his hand. Whereas um, his polistravion, uh, his like uh, bishop's vestment consisting of you know, a variety of crosses, tends to, in terms of color, identify slightly with the background. So it gives this corporeality sort of like a somewhat, not completely, but it's slightly, slightly less than diffused. Also, the uh, omophorian is very much parallel to the picture plane. So there is like playoff, like being parallel to the picture plane and also popping out of the picture playing towards our own space slightly, especially you, you get a sense in the gospel. The gospel is sort of what is more directly in the transitional space between our space and, and the same. So it has almost like a, an illusionistic kind of like in dimension while retaining the abstraction. So the crosses in the omophorian, for example, and also the the pattern cross crosses of the of the uh, of his vestments. I was thinking, uh, you know, believe it or not, I was thinking about modern painting, and um, because I don't know if you're familiar with a painter such as uh, Casimir Malevich, and he did uh, uh, in his suprematist works from the 19, 1915s to 1920s. He was working with cruciform. Uh, compositions derived from uh, the influence of icon painting. And <clears throat> so in my, in the back of my mind, I was like, all right, I want to sort of like reclaim that. I want to, I want to make the process sort of like an echo of what uh, Malevich was doing. And also with the, um, the close tonal relationship between the background and his uh, his vestment, uh, the pinkish uh, beige color. I was also thinking of Ad Reinhardt, because Ad Reinhardt uh, in the 40s and, and 50s developed this very um, simplified format of, of uh, it was a cruciform format as well, a very close like values where you at first encounter the painting as a totality of one color. But when you contemplate it and you stay with it, you begin to discern that there is actually a composition based on the, on the cross. And so in my view, uh, Malevich, um, Ad Reinhardt, and also a third, a third person that I had in my mind was Yves Klein. Because Yves Klein was an avant-gardist from like the 1960s or late 1950s, 60s 
from the Parisian avant-garde. He um, had this epiphany as when he was in the beach, looked up to the sky and he claimed the blue of the sky as his own color. And he developed a whole language, artistic language predicated on the color blue because of his mystical notions of the void. There is a famous picture of him leaping into the void. He rigged up this performance where like he stood at the edge of the roof of this building and leaped onto the sky. And uh, he had assistants sort of like with, with, you know, catching him at the bottom and had photographers take pictures and he like coordinated it. So like they produced the photograph and it actually seems as if he's flying into the sky. And that ties up to Malevich's notion of suprematism because in his compositions, he had this notion that he thought he had gone past beyond the azure of the sky. His he had broken beyond the atmosphere. And his compositions has, have this notion of, of floating forms. And so this going beyond gravity. So the going beyond gravity, the void, compositions that are ultimately bared down, in my view, is a strain within modernism that actually uh, taps into the notion of the apophatic. And so <clears throat> uh, we could debate on whether it is, you know, a, a good handle on the, the concept or, you know, it's, um, it's of course, it's, they're, they're interpreting in, in, in their own terms for aesthetic purposes and revolutionary purposes. But I think it has to be acknowledged that it does also have uh, underpinnings that relate back to the Christian tradition of apophaticism. And so <clears throat> all these things were basically in the back of my mind when I put this together. For the viewer, it's something that you can't expect every person to actually, um, you know, know all this, or I'm not expecting them to know this. But I think that's for my for for me, it's what actually fuels the creative process and brings all these components together in a meaningful way that actually makes the icon lively, dynamic, and not just a repetition of something that has come, although it is integrated into. Uh, the tradition with respect. Um, so that's pretty much, I'll stop there and then we'll, we'll take it from there. Wow, great. That was, that was really good. Um, at this point, I'm going to pass it to my colleague, Justin Wilson, uh, who recently completed a dissertation on Russian icon. So I'm guessing he might have a, a few questions about the icon and maybe about something else. Great, great. Hi, Father Siloan. Hello. Uh, you know, Justin, you look familiar, and I don't know, I don't know why, but okay. you know, I probably have seen a picture of you when I was looking up for like, you know, the group or something. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh well. Yeah, it's great to meet you. Um, good to meet albeit you. online, but yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you for 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 sharing a really rich reflection on um, the icon because it is such a striking piece for a lot of different reasons and yet at the same time as you said it's not I, I i would agree with you it's not overly assertive it's not aggressive it's not um sort of self-consciously staging its individuality it, it it plays with subtle trends and modernism and you can see how the use of color and frontality and kind of deft handling of of, of planes and gesture are very, very familiar to the Byzantine and Russian tradition, but it does with the blue thrown in there and the contrast with the very gold color of, of, of the hair and the beard um, creates these subtle contrasts and dialogue. And so I guess one of the, I, I have, I guess, really kind of three or four questions. And one of them would be, for instance, thinking about what you call the concreteness of the face and how you used gold against the halo to kind of bring out the face. Cause it does like, when I saw this, I was reminded of like Van Gogh's sort of tenant. Mm -hmm. so, since you mentioned yeah. all of these modernists, yeah. I, it reminded me of Van Gogh sort of saying, I create my pictures based on contrast. And he, he listed explicitly like orange and purple, yellow mm -hmm. and blue, 
red and green and when you kind of look at his paintings you're like wow there really is kind of yeah. a tendency to to show these strong strong contrasts and so i wanted just to ask you about the gold uh beard in particular in the hair um because you might expect to see something like silver or or uh or brown is yes. this part of the Byzantine yeah. tradition? I'm asking right. because there aren't a whole lot of icons of yeah. Saint Genesis, or is the gold sort of your selection? And if yeah. it was, was it to create sort of strong contrast and this warmth of the of, of the face? Yeah, it, that's a very good question because I actually was. Um, it was a deliberate choice, and one that was a bit risky and. And uh, I had my own apprehensions at the time, um, because as you correctly point out, there's a tendency to, uh, if you're doing the white hair of an elder in the Byzantine tradition, it's generally either a brownish ochre or a grayish ochre, a greenish ochre as the base color. And then you build up on top of that gray, cool highlights. And so then you would get a gray beard kind of effect, right? So, <clears throat> but in this case, and you know, it's interesting that you bring Van Gogh into the pic into the picture because um, he also had this notion that he said, well, I, "What I want to do with my paintings is what what the Byzantines did with with the halo. I want to do with color." And so, you know, I guess you could, in a way. Uh, you know, you could use his words here partly because um, I wanted to what let's put it this way: what the goal does in a literal physical way, okay, with his reflective capacity, right? Um, let's say if you want to compete with that, which you is virtually impossible, but in, in the spirit of Van Gogh, it's like, how can you convey radiance and illumination coming from the saint, you know, in a way that transcends a naturalism that is predictable. And so <clears throat> then as I was working on it, uh, I decided, well, let me there is there is there is the radiance of the blue and if you you will notice that there is there are reflected light like there's reflections of the blue on his cheek for example and then there is reflections of the blue on what would be the shadow like periphery of his amophorian right so the blue although Although the darkest, uh, or you know, not the darkest color, but a dark color, one of the dark colors in the composition, still has a light quality to it. It, it has a radiance quality to it. So I thought to myself, I want to play with this notion of radiance also emanating from the hair. And so hence, then I said, let me just go with this, with this bluish i mean uh this this uh yellowish color which which will bring the composition to a pretty much a consisting of a color palette of the primaries red yellow and blue and you know you could you know you could you could break that down and and i wasn't thinking about it at the time but as i'm st stating it now you know the, you know the the trinity the trinity of, of 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 all the colors right i mean you derive the color wheel from those three primaries and those three primaries could be seen you know as theophanically pointing to the ministry of the trinity you know and so um but in any case i wasn't thinking about that i'm just going off into that tangent but get bringing it back to the notion of radiance emanating from the saint I thought, let me basically try to bring that out through the use of color uh, in the beard and the hair, and hence the use of this yellowish bright color. Um, so that's the way that that worked. And I think, you know, it, it, it um, you know, this guy, this icon has its own life because 
the way it looks like now, it doesn't look like the way it is in the picture. And the way it looks outside, when you take it outside compared to the way it looks inside, they're two different things. You know, it always changes. It has, it's unstable, you know, it's literally physically unstable because it's like when you varnish it, sometimes you run into unpredictability. So, you know, you could, you could have colors actually shift in tone, light colors could turn dark. And when you're dealing with also the issue of light, then the color relationship slightly altered based on the immediate context. Anyway, so that's basically the explanation for the, the hair. <clears throat> Thank you. That's it's really wonderful to hear you kind of walk us through the process of building up the paint layers and holding off on on the ochre and, and and really manipulating it so that it does create these these sort of radiances like it, like when i first saw it i thought it's sort of like a star against the background whereas you might sort of typically think of the face as being sort of a more opaque form amidst a glowing halo so it, it kind of reverses mm. in that sense your expectations and it makes you really sort of focus on like the pink highlights and like you said the yeah the the blue tones that do sort of bring you down to the omophorian which again is a sort of interesting choice given that you would expect like a white omophorian here it sort of mm -hmm. subtly subtly sort of echoes the the circle and makes you think about kind of the geometry of circle and cross so there, yeah. there's just a lot going on there but I, I guess i wanted to ask you um one other thing which is i i'd be interested to hear not only the kind of big names and the big modernists that, that, that inflect your visual lexicon, like the Malevich or um, Ad Reinhardt, you know, these people that are, that are big names in, in, in modern art, but also like ordinary things. And particularly, I'm thinking about your, um, some of the literature you shared with us, like printed media. And I know, I know you have certain thoughts about the printed mechanical reproduction is, is is kind of distracting the eye from the craft of painting or the, the iconicity but I, I'm, I'm asking because I've, I've, I've done some work on um, old believer painters and other icon painters who play with images from magazines that like mm -hmm. like they, they see a, a photo of, of, of a Turk of, of a chicken and then they you know incorporate this not you know line for line or point for point but just they sort of like the form of the chicken and then it, it, it finds its way into for instance like a scene of peter's doubting or something mm -hmm. so that the icon painter is able to sort of like you sort of said reclaim things from modernism or from the wider world but then incorporates them into a a, a, a sacred mm -hmm. uh, image and so i wondered if, if, if not only you drew on kind of major trends in modernism, but also wider culture. And do you see sometimes a mechanically produced image inflecting your own thoughts about painting or practices in, in, in ways that are positive? Well, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's, that, that could be taken in different directions because um, I, I've always have, I've always had, I was trained in a context that was not, um, it did not, you know, I, my, my, my fine art training did not emphasize the traditional uh, study of nature. And so, so part of my struggle throughout the years has been my relationship to, nat to nature, you know, because because I, I find it, uh, you know, I think of myself, would I ever like sit down and like do a landscape? I, I, I would find it boring that, you know, I, I just, that's just me, you know, and I'm not deprecating other painters that do that. I'm just saying that's just the, my sensibility, partly due to my, my training. Um, so, so, so for example, um, I find myself, if I'm going to conceptualize a tree or something like that, um, I'll, I'll, instead of using references from nature, I use 
references from non-Orthodox or non-Byzantine artistic traditions. And inevitably, the only way for me to get access to this is through books. You know, I have, I'm building up a collection of tanga painting. That's another thing that I didn't bring up. The use of multicolored halos is partly related to the influence of tanka painting, the Tibetan painting tradition. And <clears throat> so um, sometimes when I'm conceptualizing, for example, how am I going to break down uh, the modeling of a cross, the modeling of a chalice, like how to, how do I, what components do I maintain so it is a convincing representation, but is simplified enough that it doesn't get over, over, over too carried away with naturalistic kind of like, you know, so I need to abstract this, you know, I have to conceptualize the object. And the way that I, that I do that is by looking at different artistic traditions. And in recent years, this has been uh, the Tanka tradition and the Persian and Indian miniature tradition. And so, um, so I think th you could even add to that, that for example, recently, uh, a, you know, our abbot got some bowls because we, we were running, running out of bowls. They break and you need to get some, right, uh, for soup. And he got some that have like patterns with different color relationships. And so I took a picture of that because I thought, well, that's a good color relationship and I need, I need to use that later. Um, and I also saw two towels laying somewhere one a cool red another one a, a warm red and i said all right that's the kind of red, red relationships that i need for the dragon that i'm working on and so then i photographed that and so similarly you could say that i could if i would be dealing with conceptual problems if i run into a a, a card um or a magazine picture or whatever, or a website, you know, I, I definitely would use any, any kind of like reference material that I would need from any kind of printed or electronic source or photographs. Um, so all of it just basically, um, it takes me a while because I'm not, I'm not an extemporaneous kind of painter. I, I have to do like drawings at least two to three times before I actually do the icon. And so it is a process of distillation until the concept is like concretized enough that then I'm, I'm able to execute the icon. But even within the painting process, then I come up with, with solutions and ideas mainly in the color articulation, such as the one we were discussing earlier that are extemporaneous that come through the process not premeditated. I don't know if that answers your question, but I think it touches to some degree aspects of it. <laughs> yes, no, it's, it's really interesting hearing you talk about encountering things and it sort of clicks like it's the way that I can need to look and it's a set of towels or something. I mean, that, yeah, I was hoping for a little insight kind of into your creative process and that, that was exactly it. Um, maybe just one last, thing you actually already kind of touched on it a little bit and then other people can ask questions but I, I was interested in your use of drawings and that was one of the things I wanted to ask you about is um, how do you work from drawings do you find yourself ever um, you know kind of really completely reworking something when you sort of see it scaled up or scaled down um, are you sort of sitting back and, and, and referencing your drawings with other drawings? Do you, do you look at other icon painters' drawings? Do you look at the old drawing books? What, what is your relationship to that aspect of painting an icon? 
Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, <clears throat> the drawing is the key. The drawing is the structure, is the skeleton for everything else. The problem with that is that you could get like a bit too bogged down, too um, uh, pre-med, like you could, you could enter too much into wanting to premeditate it too much, right? You know, and, but, you know, I, as I said before, um, the ectemporal medium is such that it's semi-translucent or is translucent. So you, what you, you cannot enter into the painting with just basically uh, a, a process of uh, erasure because you will always see the mistakes underneath. Okay, you can never cover them up completely. Okay, so you need to have it uh, as, as well conceptualized as possible prior to you actually putting it Put it, putting it on the on the panel. Now, now there are some painters, and I've there is an icon behind me of Singuri Palamas. I did that one on the board without any premeditated drawing, but I was drawing with dry pigment and water until I got the drawing right, and then I blocked it in with egg tempera, and then proceeded to paint. Okay, so that's that's that method. But in other instances, I'm looking at. Um, the basically the 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 iconologic tradition there is an iconological tradition meaning that there is a compositional like uh, standardization of topics or themes theological themes so if you're doing the enunciation you have specific parameters that you have to follow so you saw okay before conceptualizing the the drawing look at those parameters then you look at a variety of, 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 of different painters. What has been the way that, that that theme has been interpreted throughout the tradition, throughout history. Then, <clears throat> then you go on and select a few primary sources, so to speak, that you will rely as your main references. And then you do your own drawing. But while you're doing your own drawing, I could be looking at Indian painting and I could be looking at, at Persian painting and Tanga painting. And so all of those different strains and traditions come in. Now, the parameters are set pretty much, but there is a lot of, a lot of leeway in your interpretive capacities. And that's the that's the challenge, and that's that's very difficult because one danger is that you don't want to like suffer through the pain of coming up with an interpretation, so you err on making a mechanistic duplicate of somebody else's conception. The other danger is you want to be too bold and brave and like you know go crazy novelty and then overstep the bounds and then do something that is just like inappropriate, you know? And so, so you have to find the, the sweet spot between those two extremes. Uh, but I do one initial sketch. I could do another one that uh, could be, at, for example, I could, I could bring it to Staples or some kind of like place where I could blow it up to a larger scale if it needs to be a larger you know uh icon and then and then i do another drawing based on that and then once i get the final draft then i transfer that same draft as an ink drawing on the board so i'm using pretty much a late medieval early renaissance technique you know, uh, Alpera Durer was still using that technique. I mean, not not uh, the technique, what I'm saying is with the ink drawing on the board, on the gesso board. And, <clears throat> and so, and then on top of that, then you build up the different color relationships and layers, you know? But that, that inner drawing, that like 
it's it takes a while for for it to be concretized and conceptualized to the point where you trust it. Uh, so, okay, I don't know what what uh what else uh yeah thanks that was that was exactly you know, what you were well, thinking of the well yeah the what basic, i was hoping you were kind of talk about yeah the yeah. kind of stages of the drawing which is really interesting that you know sort of going back to the corpora of byzantine and russian and then and then allowing other things to kind of inflect your interpretation but um 